Uh, it's been probably five, five, six, maybe a decade since I really had a, a um, focused, concentrated look at wines from the Northwest. What, uh, after three days of taking a look at them, what stood oh, out? Unquestionably, well, Syrahs. Syrahs are incredible. And in fact, the uh, group of Syrahs we had today was as good as I've had anywhere and surpasses many of the known Appalachians in California. I would say they're rich and they're pretty balanced and they have lots of subtleties to them that are quite uh, intriguing and fine. Is there a concern about uh, over extraction on some of them? Are they getting close? Um, I thought the wines were very well balanced. I had no problem with extraction on these wines. Uh, when I, um, many wines, Syrahs, there are many Syrahs that we see in the New World that are highly extracted. But these were quite well balanced. Okay. Now, it's uh, after judging the competition, uh, you found wines that you liked, but you wanted to know what the price is. Well, where of are course. these where are these going to fit in? Well, at this point, I just know them as code numbers and and varietals. I have no idea what the pricing point is. Um, I imagine they're going to be price worthy, uh, uh, and it's all relative to what's being delivered and the price of the product. We're uh, at you know, Beverages and More. Uh, when I spoke to you earlier this year, you talked about the millennial market right. and uh, the price structures. There's kind of three different price structures. Yeah. Where do you see the wine industry at uh, nine months later? <laughs> it seems to be that we are uh, unofficially in a recession. What's happening to the wine? It's changed. It has definitely changed. No question about it. Um, I see people buying wines slightly lower in price per unit than they had been buying. Uh, so if someone were buying like a $20 bottle of wine, they're probably looking more at $10, $12. Some uh, were buying a $40 bottle of wines, they're probably looking at maybe $30, $35, maybe, maybe $25. So people want, what's happening is that the millennial group who have been enjoying wines, fine wines uh, for a time, are not going to sacrifice quality of flavor, but they do want better pricing. Now, is this an, an additional opportunity for Northwest to, to gain a share of the marketplace because the wines are generally a little less? Yeah, I think that there is an opportunity here for sure um, based upon what's been, uh, the Syrahs from the Pacific Northwest have shown very good and good in the pricing structure as well. I do see that uh, uh, it's competitive the California wineries have to react too, and they are reacting as well to the marketplace downturn. But I think that Pacific Northwest probably has a slight edge because they already have more value wines in the same kind of categories. Okay. And the, uh, as far as Syrah, were any other uh, kind of snapshots that you saw of things that you liked? Well, I, I enjoyed the Merlots. I thought they were really quite good. They were got more character and more interest in Merlot as we all know, is a difficult category for flavor interest. Um, often made as a also ran wine because they're soft and easy to drink. Uh, I think Merlot is reaching to be more interesting and these wines today I, that we had the last couple of days seem to be more interesting. Do you see uh, an area where the Northwest should focus more of its attention on and, and not so much on other varieties or ways of making wine? Well, I think that the Pacific Northwest should keep doing what they're doing. They seem to be uh, growing at a nice rate of improvements. Uh, tannin management seems to be better than ever, uh, but not always all the way there yet. Um, I think that the uh, categories of specific categories, like Merlot, um, Cabernet, Syrah, Riesling, are areas that they can definitely do well at. They just have to find their, their niche. They gotta find where they belong. I think if they keep true to their flavors, they will uh, continue to build upon was already a pretty good thing. It was 330 Northwest wines, and there were some observations that you made about some varieties and some winemaking practices. Go ahead and share those. I think the Rieslings are showing really well, and in particular, uh, the drier styles are doing extremely well. 
<clears throat> it would be nice if more of those wines were available nationally so that uh, the rest of the country could see what uh, Columbia Valley does with Riesling. And I also think that the prices are sometimes a little too low for people to take them seriously. I mean, $10, $11 for some of the best wines I've ever tasted. And, you know, a lot of people in this country buy wine by price, and I think if it's $10, it can't be any good. <clears throat> the other thing that's really interesting and I'm really pleased with is the fact that so many of the red wine blends seem to be better structured and better flavored than we've ever seen. And I think a good reason for that probably is the fact that some of the uh, Cabernets and um, Syrahs are taking up a good portion of the fruit, which is fine, but um, those wines are really long, longer lived. They need better time in the cellar, the tannin levels are a little ag aggressive. The blended wines have come out just wonderfully, and we gave a whole lot of gold medals in the in the Tri-Cities competition to the blended reds, and they're really, really superb wines. It seemed like Syrah was a, a as far as we could tell, it seemed to be a, a component that was really showing well in those blends. Yeah, I think the Syrah is doing really, really well. And I think part of that is due to the diligence of some of the viticultural people. I think that they're making a better statement in the vineyard and giving the winemakers better fruit to, uh, to deal with. <clears throat> as you well know, I've always believed that Cabernet in this uh, climate is a little on the tricky side. We had some good Cabernets, but it was really hard to get gold medals because a lot of these wines are just a little on the hard uh, edge side, and I think the tannin levels can be a little bit aggressive. And it's difficult on judges to see past uh, one or two more years in the bottle and say, well, you know, in seven years this will be great wine. And so what happens is that you end up with uh, more interesting flavors and in, in particular structures out of the Syrahs. And those were, those were really good wines. We gave a lot of gold medals on those. You seem to say uh, have a, a feature and wanted to send a statement to the winemakers or in Cabernet Franc around here. I, uh, <clears throat> I think the completely underrated grape variety here is Cabernet Franc. I think the potential is great. Um, the flavors can be a little bit challenging because it does have a little bit of a kind of a green edge to it sometimes and maybe a little tobacco or something like that. But the flavors of the red currant and the black currant and some of the other flavors you're getting, I, I think the potential here is just unbelievable. <clears throat> we didn't see as many Cabernet Francs as we did, say, uh, Syrahs, but the ones that we did see, there were a lot of very nice wines and I think the structures are really, really uh, impressive. Yeah, I think a Cabernet Franc with food is uh, somewhat of a, a, a purist's uh, expression of how to serve it. And uh, Cabernet Franc in, in itself is not something that people just automatically pick, pick off the shelf. They don't just walk into a shop and say, hey, what's the next greatest Cabernet Franc I can find? You know, mm -hmm. they, it's somewhat of a um, kind of a hand sell item. But I think that in general, the Cabernet Francs that I'm seeing, certainly out of Columbia Valley, uh, really have shown some great, great structure in the last few years, and in particular, the most recent vintages, uh, really excellent. Well, I'm certainly not the one to ask about Chardonnay. I'm not a big uh, fan of it, but uh, in particular, uh, the wines here have, uh, are showing somewhat erratic natures, and I think part of it is uh, winemakers that try to extract too much out of the wine, uh, whether it's uh, too much malolactic. Uh, I mean, I understand people want to do 100% malolactic fermentation. I think it's important for some uh, wineries, uh, house styles, but I think that sometimes the best thing to do is to leave yourself an option by leaving some wine in the stainless steel tank, no contact with wood, no contact with uh, malolactic, and uh, then do a blend and see if you can maybe bring the fruit back into the wine. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the most important uh, aspect of Columbia Valley uh, should not be ignored, and that is uh, the opportunity to make wine that has a faint trace of, shall we call it, herbaceous component. I don't think there's anything negative about that. I think a small amount uh, can be incredibly complexing. And I think the most important part of that is that the wines uh, that uh, are really, really good often get uh, uh, some negative comments from people in the, uh, shall we call it, the glossy magazine trade. And so instead of a, a really great statement of a wine that has a little bit of tobacco in it or a little bit of spinach or something like that, you're ending up with these uh, people giving them really poor scores and demeaning the wine instead of just uh, saying, well, this is a regional style. And I think that's important for the consumer. I think that they should uh, support those wines because not only are they interesting now, but they get better in the bottle. I mean, nobody, nobody ages uh, Cabernet just for maturity. The, you age Cabernet so that you can get to that 
uh, sort of uh, uh, faint dried herb character that is so fascinating and so interesting in, uh, in uh, an aged uh, red wine.